because I don't want to have y'all have really easy late test number one and then they totally test number two because our stuff gets clicked out. That's why I need to look about. I'm 90% sure that that's going to be a good thing. Don't tell Bobby and everybody what you You got to sort of, you didn't get to get to so. Yeah, with me on all of, the, all of what we've done so far. We're gonna, okay, now it's time to shake the edges. We've been looking. What we getting married? Huh? Getting married? Oh. It's a different edge <laughs> sketch. Okay. Uh, um, good call that. Um, um, okay. we, we talked some basic supply and demand, and then we've been talking a little bit, ultimately, of consumer behavior is what we've been looking at the last couple of two, three classes about our decision making as far as if they change the price of the product, how's that going to change our mind? If they, my income changes, how's that going to change my mind? And then, in general, the decision making that I start doing based on my limited amount of money. How much is something if I could be buying or trade all something? So we've been sort of doing consumer individual thinking. Now we're switching gears and we're for the good chunk of the rest of the semester, we're going to sort of be looking at things from the business point of view. Um, which this part, we're a little bit of both because between individual households and then businesses, this, this is the later that's kind of the straddling thing, then we're going to be really focusing on the business side for a while. But labor, supply of anything is willingness and ability to produce. Supply of labor is the willingness and ability of you and I to turn off judge duty, get off the couch, and go get a job. All right. So the more of us that are willing to say, nah, I'd rather have money than watch judge duty and go get a job. Or try to get a job, that's the greater supply of labor that the companies have to pull from to hire people. With the demand for labor, it's going to be the willingness and ability of the companies to say, I want to hire people to do work. So, really, that willingness and ability, if you just hold on to that one, it works. Um, but generally, It's complicated. It's more complicated than I have here, just stick with what I have here. Because it's not just the number of people willing to work, but it's also how many hours are people willing to work. There's a bunch of people that are willing to work five, ten hours a week because they're college students and they need time to study and drink or whatever because they all do over again. Uh, but then there's other people that are like, well, I need to work 40, 50, 60, 80 hours a week. Maybe. Well, I don't know if you gave birth to an alien love child. Yeah, you need to be working extra. Until the text of PMC starts clearing, you got extra expenses you got to pay. Right? Am I right? Yeah. So, it's, so just to say the number of people and the number of businesses, that, that, that's really oversimplifying the business. Just, just to kind of think of it that way, just knowing that it's more how many of us are willing to work. The more of us that are willing to work, the more workers there are that the companies have available to be choosing from. Um, so if you have a bunch of potential workers and very few people willing to hire, what happens? You have a bunch of workers, very few companies. Those companies can pick and choose who they want. And they're going to hire the best ones, and they're not going to have to really worry about paying a whole lot of money because what do you need? If, if you pitch a bit, they can easily fire you because they can easily replace you, right? Where the flip side of things, the what we actually kind of have at the moment, and hopefully we will when y'all graduate, a what we call a tight labor market. That's when the demand for labor is stronger than the supply of labor. These companies are either saying, "I need workers, I need workers, I need workers," and they're looking around and they can't see anything. They can't find workers, so what do they got to do? They got to increase their wages when they're trying to steal somebody from the company they're already with to come and work for. Them. So, what ends up happening for wages and all that kind of stuff, job security, all that stuff, it's really tied into how many of us are there wanting to work and how many of them are there wanting to hire people. 
So hopefully when y'all graduate, it's going to be a tight labor market situation where there's not many available companies, I mean, not many available workers. So there's going to be a bunch of people hunting you down, trying to hire you, and they kind of got to play the game the way you want them to play the game so maybe you can get some more flexibility when you're negotiating with them, vacation days, sick days, all that kind of stuff when you get a job. Similar to college. Same thing for colleges, for those of you that are going to transfer in a couple of semesters, a couple of years, whatever. If you've only gotten one acceptance letter from one college, actually I had to, uh, the decision to what college you're going to go to is pretty, pretty easy, right? And you just sort of, well, that's the only college you can take me. I got to pay whatever they're going to charge me. But if you've got several colleges to hunt you down, and you've got colleges that are offering you scholarships and that kind of stuff, then you can go up there like, Daughter of a friend of mine, she's like, she got a full ride at Wake and she got a partial scholarship from Chapel Hill. And she would like tell the Chapel Hill people, uh, Wake's showing me more love than y'all are showing me. And they showed her a little bit more love. They didn't give her a full ride, but still, she ended up going to Chapel Hill because she could negotiate because she had options. So, this is what you think. I talked about this in the human resources class yesterday. The more options you have, the better off you are. As a customer, the more options you have for what you buy, then you can do things at a cheaper price. Uh, as an employer, the more options you buy, the cheaper the price that you get your labor for. As a worker, the more options you have on what you're willing to do, where you're willing to work, the more, the more you can get paid, the more you can do. Uh, but if you're like, um, there, 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 there's a, uh, Maybe that new dude just got what was his name? It's declaring to go to the NFL draft that, that we were talking about him like a week ago. But th th this kid, they're kind of thinking that he's like, he's already saying, I don't want to play for this team. I don't want to play for that team. I don't want to play for this. You, you get a couple football players every year that start saying, I don't want to go here. I don't want to go there. I only want to play Dallas or I only want whatever. Or I only want to play wherever. And what are they doing? They're limiting the number of teams. Just by opening their mouth, they're limiting the number of teams. Because they're telling some people, I ain't gonna go to Cleveland, I ain't gonna go to Minnesota, I ain't gonna go to Arizona. Well, they just eliminated three of their potential teams that might hire them. I ain't gonna play for the Jets, can't blame you, but but you know, it's a lot of just Antonio Brown for the Steelers. And I don't want to be here in Pittsburgh anymore. And as long as he's saying this kind of stuff. He just got five teams that he said no to. And then, of course, there's some other teams that are like, this dude's a little bit of a little bit mouthy, a little bit of a troublemaker. Maybe we don't want to bring him anywhere. So instead of when it's time time to make a contract, he, instead of having five or six or eight teams all competing with offers, I'll pay five million, somebody else I'll pay you eight, somebody else I'll pay. Instead, he's only gonna have one or two people. Or maybe only one team. And so he's gonna be sitting there going, oh, well. Great, I can go to Jacksonville or I can stay home. And he's got to take whatever Jacksonville is paying because they're the only team that will take. You got to keep options, keep your mind open. Part where you're willing to work. We measure employment two ways. We generally talk about it as far as who's not, well, the first one unemployment rate is who's not working. Who wants to work? I'll go into more detail on the next slide. And the other thing is the average work week. I do have this on the next slide. No, I don't. I'm sorry. Really? Hang on, we all have Well, I'm shocked. Okay. Yeah, we talked about some of this in 201, but I'm like, I knew that I had a slide in here. I'll show you what I know. Okay, the unemployment. Of the 320 million Americans, not all of those 320 Americans are working. They're not workers. My little two year old granddaughter is not a worker, right? Your retired great grandfather is not a worker. We have what's called the labor force. That is the part of the population that's actually, I'm out there trying to work for a bank. And that's only a little over half of us. That's about 55 to 60% of us. So the rest of them are 
kids, retired people, people in prisons, people in hospitals, rich folk that don't have to work because they married rich, or stay at home parents, stay at home with kids because they married rich enough. So, all total, the unemployment rate is of the labor force. Of the, I don't know, 180 million of us that say, I'm out there trying to get a job, I'm, try, I'm out there trying to work. Of the 180 million of us who are willing and able to work, what percentage of them don't have a job? Right now, it's 2.8. Is that, you just making up that number? That, that's close. I mean, that's close. That's why I'm asking. So right now, of the 180 million of us, there's only like 3% of that 180 are out of work. That are, they're saying, I don't have a job for pay, and I'm trying to get a job for pay. Somebody please hire me. So if somebody doesn't have a job, they're considered part of the unemployment rate. But what about somebody that does have a job? What about somebody that has two jobs? You still count it. You count you, you work. What if somebody um, you have a job that works you one hour a week? Is that getting it done? No. Is that meeting your needs? No. But do you have a job? Yeah. So guess what? You ain't part of the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate just is measuring the number of people, but like we just talked about a few minutes ago, that's kind of fuzzy. Where the average work week is saying, on average, for the 180 million people in the labor force, how many? How many hours a week are they working? Those people that are unemployed are working zero hours a week, right? So the more people that the more people that are out of work, the more zeros there are being added into that total calculation. So the average amount of work being done per worker is going down. As the unemployment rate is improving, as more people are getting jobs, the amount of hours that people work. Are improving as somebody goes from working two or three or five hours a week to now they're working 40 hours a week that's an improvement and the average work week will capture that so the unemployment rate would people that all right so say like someone who is working for pay on bond but isn't the income isn't taxed it's like an underpaid job but that's still pay. Technically, they are employed. They can try to lie and file for unemployment benefits and put zero down on a 1044 and hope not to go to jail for fraud, but they are working for a pay, even though it's on the count. We use, as Bobby's getting to, they talk about the unemployment rate. We just talk about that. It's a little bit buzzier for the numbers, but it's easy to get. Because most people that you lose your job, what are you going to do? Within two days, you get fired today. You're gonna to go home this afternoon and do what? Cry. You're gonna do what? Tomorrow you're gonna to wake up at 10 o'clock, you can sit there and sweat, you can watch Judge Judy and the talk and whatever stuff with the view or whatever it is on the TV in order. Then you can be watching Andy Griffith three runs in the afternoon, you need to save a bunch of crap. And so then what are you gonna be doing the next day? Looking for a job. You can go to the unemployment office and say, uh, I still got bills, start sending me checks, start helping me find a job. So it's generally easy to keep up with the unemployment rate because they look at how many people are collecting unemployment checks. So that's an easy number because it's, it, each unemployment office in each county has those numbers and they just send them to Richmond, to Richmond sends them to DC, boom, they've got that number real easy. Where it's a whole lot harder to be going out and asking workers, going where the workers are and asking them how many hours did you work this week, how many hours did you work next week. And then to try to compile that. The average work week is more accurate, it is better, it's better flavor change, but it's a whole lot harder to compute. As opposed to messing with the number that's already there. So we did had this a couple times in Econ 201 last semester. We know the unemployment rate number ain't perfect, but as long as we keep measuring it the same way, we can look at the trends. If the unemployment rate is going down, some well, then that's going to be a suggestion the average work week is going up. So, maybe it's not perfectly capturing that, but it's pretty easy. So, you can get a little bit more accurate, but you got to do a heck of a lot more work. 
This is the difference between y'all studying one hour and saying that's enough versus y'all studying five hours to try to get the perfect grade. Somewhere along the line, y'all study to the point where you say it's good enough, right? That's kind of the unemployment rate. It's good enough. Good enough for government work is the expression here. That's what you think. So, labor market, we saw this from last semester. This, you think, the labor market involves our demand for workers as companies. The labor market involves our supply of workers as workers. And put the two together and ask them to determine what the actual wages are going to be in society. And like what we were talking about a few minutes ago, hopefully more companies are going to say, I need workers, I need workers, I need workers, and then what's going to happen to wages? That's the dream. That's why we're hoping for the, the economic recovery, and we're hoping it will continue to recover. We hope the stock market does good. We hope that the trade war with China goes away, and we hope things keep going so companies will be like, dude, the future looks better, so we need to hire more workers, and y'all are out here going to the store. Right. That's the dream for where y'all are hopefully going to be in a couple of years. Where sometimes, and the other thing, um, the other fun thing that's working in y'all's favor is we have an automatic one of these that's starting to happen. It decreased the supply of labor. Y'all heard of the baby boomers? Yeah, the baby boom. Well, it started in 1946. Soldiers and sailors came home, they had a twinkle in their eye in the end of 45, and so we were starting to get 46, bunch of babies started in the ground. Then the doctors picked them up, wiped them off, and gave them to the mothers. Oh, but, okay, do the math. From 1946 to 19, or 2019, whatever this year is, but they're hitting retirement age. So you had this big bubble of an abnormally high amount of babies being born for a handful of years. And so then, during the 80s or 90s, uh, the early 2000s, you had an abnormally high number of workers that are, as they get more experience working with a job, now they're getting bumped up to middle management, upper management, and that kind of stuff, because they're the ones with 20, 30 years worth of experience, that kind of stuff, and now they're starting to retire. So hopefully, what's going to be happening is there's going to be an increase in the, well, increase in the number of openings for managerial positions, business type positions, those kind of things, because the same number of positions, but fewer workers because more of them are leaving and coming in, which is why your college degree hopefully is going to put you in the right spot. And what are you going to be getting there? Mm -hmm. Starting wages for people in business management hopefully are going to be increasing. Starting salaries will be increasing over the next few years. Or y'all are kind of coming in at a good amount. I'm not going to penalize. Oh, I could be evil, but I'm not going to. Please don't. It's not going to be on a test, but just, okay. Um, September 11th, 2001. We lost a couple thousand members of the workforce. And result, it didn't happen overnight, it shouldn't happen overnight, got lost in all of everything else that went on, but if that was all that happened, wages would have gone up. But it, that wasn't all that happened because what ended up happening on September 12th, everybody's sitting home scared, watching TV, and nobody's working, and only things that we're buying are duct tape, flashlight batteries, that kind of stuff. And so the economy ended up hitting recession, which caused Decrease in the demand for workers, wages went down, unemployment went up. But if it would have just been the one thing without the fear and whatever to go along with it, wages would have actually gone up. There's a reason why economics is called a dismal science. That's great. Okay. So. 
the determinants of labor demand. What makes a company say, I want people instead of machines, and dare say, I want more people than I had before? Yeah, man, Yeah, first, how much are we selling? If we're selling more cakes today than we did yesterday, I need more workers to be baking those cakes today than yesterday. If I'm selling less cakes, I don't need as many workers. So I cut back their hours, I fire a couple of people. Whatever I have to do. So if I'm selling more, I'm going to be more likely to hire more people. Number two is how much work can I get out of those workers that I'm hiring? If the only people that I have available to hire are those lazy slackers from Alberta High, doesn't exist. I don't want to offend anybody from Parkview, but anyway. Yeah, Parkview people. You ain't get admitted now. Okay, okay. Just don't. Uh, but the more work I can get out of workers makes the idea of hiring a worker a better option. If I can hire a worker and that worker can only bake me one cake an hour, maybe I'm not interested in hiring them. But if something is some, if I can get that worker to bake four cakes, five cakes, six cakes an hour, maybe I'll hire that person. Which brings me back to that mentioned before: the more you can do, the better off you are, the better worker. And then the other thing is the change in price and substitutes for labor, namely machines. If workers get too expensive. At the same time, machines are getting cheaper. Then companies are going to say, "Well, I'm going to go less." Excuse me, less with people and more with machines. As far as price, here again, reliability. How does Pizza Hut cook their pizzas now? They have a, somebody put the sauce on, sprinkle cheese on, put the pepperoni on, and now they stick the thing in the conveyor belt and it comes out the other side. They don't have pizza artists that are going there, opening doors, sticking the pan in there, lifting up, looking at the bottom, closing, and saying, I got to come back 30 seconds. All that stuff is out the window. They just need one person in the back there, just put the sauce, put the cheese, put the pepperoni, stick it in there, and let somebody else put it in a box on the other end and keep on trucking. They're not using as many workers as they used to make pizza because we got a bunch of 16 year olds that are in there goofing off and horse playing and eating half of inventory, and those machines got cheaper. Computers allows people to do more, enough more, that we don't need as many workers. The uh, example I use is like maybe a company, old school company, would have two secretaries banging away on a typewriter, paying each of them $20,000 a year. Well, they get a, spend a couple thousand dollars on a computer, and they have one administrative assistant with a computer that can do the work where two secretaries were doing before. So they give that administrative system thirty thousand dollars a year, and then a two thousand dollar computer, thirty two thousand dollars, and they got rid of two typists, right? Yeah. So they can go both ways. Improving technology can improve the productivity of the workers, but sometimes that improving technology can replace the workers. McDonald's cashiers. McDonald's cashiers. Oh, the Walmart. Yeah, Walmart. You you self checkout replacing cashiers. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a ton of even the we've created a smartphone app so you can order your Domino's from the, your smartphone and then it'll even like start ringing or dinging or whatever. I don't know what they call it. But on the other hand, we're creating more jobs in a way too because I know that the food line in the county has like the food line on to go or whatever. Yes, and you, can, you know, you get on your phone, you can get what you want, and they'll bring it to your house. Oh, they're bringing it to the house? Okay. In some cases, yeah. Okay. Uh, you get some jobs in places, you lose some jobs in places. We'll see. Technology, just don't be one of those people that can be easily replaced. Something that you need to think about when you're thinking about your career choices for the future is how easy is it for you to be replaced by a machine? It's kind of hard to replace a nurse with a machine. Healthcare, fairly solid. I mean, what are they going to do? They're going to have a forklift that's going to lift the old lady up off of the bed in order to change how she eats snack packs? Probably not. They got a machine for it. Oh, yeah, 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 I know. But just to have that sucker fully automated and all that kind of stuff. Just, yep. Yeah. I used to think, back in the day, I used to think, well, teaching. You know, is there going to have somebody from somewhere else in the country or somewhere about the way? 
and I ended up teaching internet classes and like I can't be replaced by somebody else around the planet. So how easily can you be replaced? Labor demand. No matter how many of us say I want a job, it's really up to the employers how much they want to hire. The employers are driving employment. But where do the employers' the decision to hire workers come from? Demand. Demand for products, and who's that? Us. So it comes back to the households. It starts with us. The more products we buy as Americans from American companies, the more the American companies are going to say, oh, we need workers. So the more worker Americans, those companies are going to hire. It's kind of a double-edged sword to me, really, because if you can't get a job to pay for the things that is going to boost the economy, they're not going to hire because there's less people buying. It's just, yeah, it's... It, it, it ain't as simple as I was making it to be. Because there's, and there's the, okay, I've got a job. Woohoo! So I can do whatever to make life easier for my company. So maybe they'll hire more Americans, but I don't care. No, I'm not so worried about that. I'm worried about hey, making my limited paycheck go as far as it can go. Because I'm looking at my budget line, I'm looking at my indifference curve, and I'm saying, Based on my limited amount of money, how can I spend that money in a way that's going to give me the most enjoyment possible? I don't really enjoy stocks, so I'm okay buying some cheap imported stocks. That's going to free up some extra money so I can buy more MMs, video games, chainsaws, whatever it happens to be. So we as Americans don't really do a very good job of saying, well, as an American, I'm going to buy American-made products so I can create American-made jobs because my, we don't need to be losing American-made jobs because American jobs, my American job might be next. It's lost. We don't think that way. And then, if you don't have much money, American products tend to be more expensive. Why? Because we as Americans get paid more than a lot of people on the planet. And we're not willing to say, well, let's help out the economy, y'all. Let's all take a $2 an hour pay cut. And you are willing to do that? No. So, if you don't have any money, then if you have a limited amount of money, then you're kind of like, well, I can't afford the American product. I've got to buy it. The inexpensive imported stuff. So it's a furball there. But ultimately, did I have it on you? No. Yeah. The demand for labor, that the companies are driving the demand for labor, and that demand for labor is dependent on the demand where there's products. And that's coming back to you and I. Uh, but as we talked about, the number of workers hired ain't completely dependent on the demand for product because the, there's also how does the price the wages impact that? How many of y'all will come to work, quit working, and go get a job? Start commuting up watching Judge Judy. Poor job is going to pay you a dollar an hour. You take a dollar an hour job? Really? That's, that's all you need. It. It's got to be a catch. Yeah, it'd be a test to work. Technically, it's illegal, but I'm getting, I guess I'm paying you cash. Okay. Go out there and start washing your wife's in the Jeep. I'll give you a dollar. I'd lose what I'm Because I'd be bored. Okay. Well, like, if you ask me right now, well, I'm not saying I'm bored right now, but I'm saying. I was just saying. Oh, I <laughs> <don't> <laughs> like oh okay. I'd lose what I'm You don't realize this after you mentioned the business, but. Oh, you clean the interior and dust Oh, oh, ooh, an army jeep. Oh, that's what I need to. If I could get it here, and have oh, oh, oh. You got an army jeep? Yes, this is 1942. It actually saw action in the war. It's got bullet holes in the bed and the footwork. I want to see it. Good luck, Lance, and that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but I kind of had the thing about good luck starting it. That's kind of the issue that I can deal with when I get uh, a quiet weekend. And, a quiet weekend, and it ain't like raining ice. A dog with a tour at ACL. Is it open? A dog torture ACL. And then they, my wife took it to the bed yesterday, $400. And it's like, now we got the dog you said. We're running around in the yard, have a couple acres for Now we've got to take the dog out on leash every time for the next six. Now the sun drop got to go back. She can't run. Oh, well. So, um, Okay, 
understand. I, I, I'm, I, the wages can determine. The wages and work conditions. Do I have it here? No. Oh, okay. I have to go in the wrong direction for where I'm going next because I think I'm going to go to the other one later. Um, I'll just go anywhere in my slides just in case. Somebody remind me there was something I forgot if I missed. Okay, but anyway, the, price, the wages are going to determine things. If I can hire people and I only got to pay them, if I could actually hire him to pay you to wash and wax my Jeep for a five ten dollars, yeah. But if I got to pay him a hundred dollars, no. Right? I ain't paying hundred dollars to wash my Jeep. Oh, you would. Uh, so you know that that's going to factor into things. But part of it is sort of the getting back to the what exactly are you getting when you're hiring a worker? Marginal means what? Extra. Extra. Remember that one for the test next week. <laughs> Physical means what? Hey, a little Something you can touch. Product. A product. <laughs> a product. It's a production, something you make. So, how much extra product are you going to get by hiring this worker? By hiring another cook, how many extra cakes is that person going to be able to bake? How many extra cakes are you going to get by hiring this person? Cool. Give me the name of the human being. Max. Who? Max. Max. If we hire Max, how many extra cakes is Max going to bake us? And then we ask, marginal is extra. Revenue is Money. Yeah. income. Well, product. The thing. How much extra money are we going to get from the extra cakes? If I hire Max, I'll get an eight, extra eight cakes a day. And by hiring Max, getting these extra eight cakes, I sell each one of them for twenty dollars each. I'm going to get an extra hundred and sixty dollars every day because I hired Max. Okay. So then I have to put that with the third one up here, the, on the top, extra. Resource is what? Something that you can use, and then cost is what you got to pay for something you use. What is it going to cost me to hire Max? And if I can hire Max, and he's going to give me eight cakes, he's going to give me $160 a day, how much am I going to have to pay Max? And is it going to cost me more than $160 a day to get Max working for me? If I can get Max working for me for less than $160, what do I do? I hire him. I hire him, and I get $160 worth of cake out of him, and I make some profit. That's the math that you do. But what if you was paying him $159? If you pay him 159 in order to get $160, it's a dollar. A dollar's better than nothing. And the goal of your business is to make you the most profit possible, and that's an extra dollar a day. Five dollars a week, two hundred dollars a year, two hundred fifty, three hundred dollars a year. Yeah, three hundred dollars a year. I'm I'm down with that. How I many you like an extra three hundred dollars a year? Okay. If you're not happy with extra three hundred dollars a year, don't ask your boss for a quarter an hour pay raise, right? I'm just saying. But you kind of have. We talked about this at some point last semester. Right? You kind of have to think. What is it going to cost me to hire Max? Maybe I'm going to hire Max, and I got to pay him ten dollars an hour. Eight hours a day, it's only going to cost me $80. It's going to be paying for Max. Okay, plus the money that I got to pay for his health insurance, plus the money I got to put in for his unemployment benefits, plus the money I got to set aside for his retirement if I'm going to be a good boss and do something like that. So that $80 may be going in his pocket, but I might end up having to pay like $100 for $110 to have Max there. But Max is brand new, $10 an hour worker. And Josie's like, wait a minute, I've been working here three years, and you're only paying me $10 an hour, and you're going to pay this dude who's been here three minutes the same pay as me? What's Josie going to do? She's going to get mad. She's going to get mad. She's going to she quit. And then she's going to quit. Oh, okay. So she quits. So what happened? I gain the work to Max. I lose the worker, Josie. I'm right back where I started from in the first place, except I've lost the three years worth of experience that Josie had, and i am got to go out and hire somebody else because there's a reason why I was hiring Max in the first place, because I needed somebody to make me some more gates. So what am I going to have to do? I don't want Josie to quit. 
So what am I going to have to do? I got to give her a pay raise. So, okay, so maybe I got to pay Max $10 an hour, but I got to give Josie a dollar an hour pay raise. So suddenly, $10 an hour is going to Max, a dollar an hour is going to Josie. Huh? Now you're spending eleven dollars an hour setting aside for give out appointment and health and retirement. All that. Right. I'm spending eleven dollars an hour. But Love Lean's like, oh wait a minute, I've been working here five years. Now suddenly Josie just got a little pay raise to she's making the same money as me. Crap. So I gotta give her a pay raise. Carrie's like you well, wait a minute. Now I gotta give you a pay raise. And next thing you know, Mike goes to me and I gotta give everybody a Jordan pay raise, right? And so suddenly, so you got to look at what are all of the implications for hiring Max? What, I, what money is going to go into Max for his pay? What money is going to go to Max as far as unemployment benefits, health insurance benefits, the paperwork that you're going to have because you got one more worker you got to keep up with? Just don't Plus, say. all of those pay raises that I have to give my other workers to keep them from getting mad and quitting. So then I got to look at all that money and compare it to that marginal. Revenue product, how much compared to that $160? When you add all those costs in there, what's it going to cost me? Is it worth it to hire Max? And that's sort of it depends. Because as I said here, it might cost you more than just one person's wages. It costs Max this $10 an hour, and then the dollar an hour that I'm giving Joe to, dollar an hour I'm giving Love Lane, and dollar an hour I'm giving Karen. Well, if I if, okay now if Max could come in and do sixteen cakes an hour, well then that's bringing me three hundred and twenty dollars a day. So even if I do have to give her a pay raise, or I can, I could say, well look, you're only doing eight cakes an hour. Well, he's doing ten cakes an hour, so that's why he's getting paid the same. Yeah, I'm giving you the same money as him. You've got three years experience, but he's doing twice the number of gates. If you want to pay a raise, step up your game. You can have that conversation, except it's illegal for you to have that conversation because I just violated his privacy. Save me human resources class. We just we don't been talking about that yesterday. You can't be violating somebody's privacy by telling someone else how their that they are. You can you can say there's other people that are working better than you. You can't, you can't, you're not supposed to be getting, naming, naming that kind of, you're violating somebody. Because maybe Max is like, well, you know, I'm like the cake whisperer or whatever, but I just kind of feel like weird about it. And I'm okay making money off of it, but it's just a favorite body to whisper around. Like, you can teach that, teach that, whatever, that kind of crap. You can't get beat up in a parking lot after school. Right. How, how many of you in high school got a good grade on a test? The first thing you did was fold it in half and hope nobody saw it. There are people. Do you know people that did that? Yeah. There's reasons for people to do that. It, it makes sense to them. It might not make sense to you. It might not make sense to me. But then you so you can't violate people's privacy. You just don't tell you other work that you pay more. That's the other thing. You don't tell people how much people are getting paid. But one of the last, and we'll talk about this later this month. One of the last things you want to do is have your workers discussing their salaries with one another because that's when Joseph's going to realize, hey, Mr. Freeman is getting paid the same money as I am because you're sitting in a break room discussing your salary. Hey, Max, how are you doing? Welcome to the company. What are they paying you? Well, I got hired. Who might Awkward. Don't get told. Hmm? The first thing they told me was, um, don't. Don't talk to me about that. Yeah, a lot of businesses tell you not to talk about it. They'll make it be if I find out you talk about it, you're out of here. But they they will say they can do that. But they can try to do that. But then the other thing is like be a little bit bank out, hope a little bit of guilt. Because if nobody Max doesn't know what other people are making, Max might like feel stupid because it's like I'm getting ten dollars an hour. And how stupid is he going to feel if he finds out that everybody in the company is making twenty dollars an hour? He negotiated quarterly and only got ten. Well, he gonna come to you. He gonna feel stupid. So maybe there's no. There's a lot of people. They're like, I'm not going to broach the conversation in the first place. The last thing I want is for somebody to find out that I did a poor job negotiating and that the company pulled one over on me. Right. He can help me. 
infinity. Don't violate anybody's rights. Okay. So this slide just did what we just said. If the marginal revenue product, the money, that $160 that you're going to make from the cakes that Max is going to sell, if that is higher than that marginal resource cost of all of the money you got to pay Max, the money you got to pay because of Max, the pay raises you have to pay your other workers, if those costs are less than the benefit of $160, then you hire Max to make it happen. Hire Max, give pay raises, sell more cakes, make more money. If the cost is for the pay raises, the hiring, the unemployment benefits, that kind of stuff. If it's higher than the $160, you don't hire max. You try to find somebody cheaper. You try to find a conveyor belt machine thing that will make the cakes for you. The Star Trek replicator raised a computer cake. These slides are looking pretty for you here. One of the things that companies do is they start out with, well, how many workers do we need? Especially starting a new company to begin with, how many workers do we need? And that starts with how much work needs to get done. We need 10,000 t-shirts a month. Because we can sell 10,000 t-shirts a month. If we don't make them, we can't sell them. And we know we can sell 10,000 of them, so we want 10,000 of them. Or else we can make as much money as we put off of this deal. So we need 10,000 t-shirts a month. So our workers can make 10 t-shirts an hour, which means we have a thousand hours worth of work that we need to get done in a month. I'm not gonna test you on this, but this is probably the exercise for this. We've got a thousand hours worth of work to do in a month. Can one person do a thousand hours worth of work in a month? Maybe can, there ain't a thousand hours in a month. Yeah, I guess there is, maybe. Not a bad thing. So let's break that down in work shifts. If our workers are working eight hours a day, we have 125 days worth of work to get done in a month. Is there 125 days in a month? No. Okay, and we know, well, how many work days are there in a month? Call it 20 for weeks, all right? So we need six and a quarter people. If we have six and a quarter people working 20 days a month, eight hours a day, Consistently working, we will get our 10,000 t shirts now. So, what happens if you only hire four? You ain't gonna hit your goal. What happens if you hire six? You're not gonna hit your goal. You need six and a quarter. So, what do you do? Hire them. <laughs> you could go ahead and round up. Oh, we'll come to the middle. I'm not gonna work into the Okay, you can't say, well, we need six and a quarter people. Six ain't enough. Let's go ahead and do seven because guess what? People are going to call in sick, right? People are going to take vacation days. So if we have seven people, then that will give us some flexibility that we'll need as far as when people call in sick. When, you know, when that person actually sticks their hand in the machine, stops off a couple fingers, and everybody else is freaking out for a while and all that kind of stuff, right? And that's what the production is going to have to be. Like, say, something goes wrong with one of the machines and you are under producing for the next couple of months. Yeah. That overstock from the month previous. Sometimes. Yeah. This can work for you. Another option, now I'm only going to hire six people. And I'm going to make them work overtime. A lot of people are okay working overtime. But it's just sort of mandatory. Okay, everybody, I'm going to hire y'all, and everybody will part of the job with you for working eight hours of overtime minimum a month. Oh, well, guess what? Every day that somebody calls in sick, well, that's just adding an overtime hour to extra hour of time to all the rest of you each month. So at the end of the month, we got to do the calculation about how many sick days, how many vacation days we're taking. We've got to add it up and then figure out how many overtime hours y'all got to work during the last week of the month. How many of y'all are happy with that? It sucks if you're doing extra overtime hours on Friday before the end of the month. Or you can say, well, I'm going to hire six people, bring in temp for a couple of days, make up for it. You do what you need to do ultimately to make sure you have the number of workers on hand to match the workload that you have. So it starts with product demand, how many are we gonna sell? That tells us how many we need to make and you work backwards to figure out how many people you're gonna hire. And thus you have your demand workers. I need six and a quarter t-shirt makers. Knowing that people call us sick, I need to hire seven people. That's what I'm going to do with my company. With me? 
that thank you, Connor, for starting with me notebook and that was a visual thing I needed to know just being in class. So any questions? Other than will I shut up and let you go? I mean another minute and ten seconds early. Well I will shut up and let you go minute and ten seconds early. Have a safe and interesting weekend and hopefully you don't have to swing back to the car.